Have you thought about this? Words are just words, right? The word building, for example, is simply just a word. And in fact, you could give it various of meanings, right? So is the word back. So is the word better. But you see, we humans have been given something I want to say is a superpower of putting together words and transforming them into life-changing sentences, slogans, phrases. We build proposals that change people's lives using just words. So have you thought about how the three words building back better came to be coined together? Well, some people have associated it more with Joe Biden's campaign slogan. However, the true origin of these words was a reconciliation and reconstruction program after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. Now, the words are used as a way of bringing back hope after disaster. What we are going to be doing today is taking you on a reconstruction journey after the disaster of the abuse of the right to freedom of expression. And on that reconstruction journey, let us fly back in time. 1644, England. A famous writer, John Milton, made an impassioned plea for freedom of expression. He wrote and said, give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to speak freely above all other liberties. This predisposes the significance of the right to freedom of expression. But again, what is freedom of expression? Well, it's fairly simple. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand what this right means. The freedom of expression is the right indeed to impart ideas, to receive information, and to also be able to disseminate it. The freedom of expression in Ugandan jurisprudence is a compound of many rights. It is a whole bouquet. It comes with the right to associate, the right to, as to assembly, the right to conscience, the freedom of religion, the freedom of movement, and all these other things. But more importantly, freedom of expression cannot be uh, dissected or divested from the freedom of conscience. We have to first be free in the mind with what we think in order to be able to utter. Therefore, freedom of expression comes from within us. And if any of you has heard about the phenomenon of the social contract, we know that we intentionally give some of our rights and freedoms to the state in exchange for protection. The state therefore then makes laws almost about everything. So this freedom of expression too is subject and is provided to by both national and international law. Nationally, it is provided for under Article 29 of the 1995 Constitution. Internationally, it is provided for under Article 9 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, as well as Article 19, Article 19 of the ICCPR. So our argument here is that the problem is not that there is no law. The question is, does this law actually guarantee the right to freedom of expression? And in answering that question, does the law guarantee the right to freedom of expression? There is an important ingredient you cannot miss when you're talking about human rights in the Ugandan context. And that is that whereas Article 29 of the Constitution provides for the freedom of expression and assembly, this right is not an absolute right. It is the position of the law that the right is not absolute and may be subject to certain limitations in certain circumstances. Article 43 of the Ugandan Constitution is instructive in this case. Article 43 legislates that any right can be limited in the public interest. However, because the framers of the Constitution knew the fragility of human rights and their fundamental importance, they added a specific clause. The framers stated that public interest in the limiting of the right to freedom of expression shall not permit political persecution. 
Secondly, which Justice Molenga in the case of Onyango Bo called a limitation upon a limitation. It is stated in the article that any limitation must pass the test of being acceptable and demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. That means that if parliament is to legislate, and for example, legislate the Public Order Management Act, seeking to impose a limitation in the public interest on freedom of expression, such a limitation must pass the test of being acceptable and also demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. If it fails that test, then it is no limitation at all, but a restriction. What we are therefore saying, that the implementers didn't revolt or laborers didn't revolt against poor working conditions. Today, there would be no labor laws. There would be no labor rights. There would never even have been freedom for slaves. So what we are saying is that when you violate the right to expression, you are violating very many other rights. What we are again saying is that expression is fundamental and is key to change in society. Otherwise, the whole argument is that, unfortunately, we are not doing well as a country. Unfortunately, indeed. Uganda has had a murky history of not really doing well with the freedom of expression and assembly. Back in time in history, Uganda had a president, President Idi Amin, who famously stated that I will guarantee you the freedom of speech, but not really the freedom after speech. Interesting. Well, in the Ugandan context, when you look at our turbulent history, it is arguable that the rights that have been violated the most are the freedoms to expression and also the rights to assembly. For instance, in 2008, the Constitutional Court at the Bank of Gavo declared that the Police Act, specifically Section 32, was unconstitutional because it didn't pass the test of being acceptable and demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. Immediately, the government ran back to parliament, contravening Article 92 of the Constitution to overturn a court decision when it legislated the Public Order Management Act. The Public Order Management Act included the same provisions as Section 32 of the Police Act, which was that the Inspector General had the powers to disperse any assembly. He literally had the powers to tell someone, you shall not protest or you shall protest. In the event, we saw that the Public Order Management Act was used as a weapon by security forces to curtail free speech and assembly, especially among the opposition ranks. In the 2016 elections, curtailing the free speech of presidential candidates, John Patrick Kamamba Babazi in the 2020 presidential elections until the time it was declared unconstitutional by the court again. But even when it was declared unconstitutional, the police continues to act as if there is no court decision in the present place. Moving forward, freedom of expression has been curtailed not only in repressive laws like the Public Order Management Act and uh, Police Act, but also in terms of parliament enacting laws that prevent the interaction and expression of people within the social media circles. A case in point, the Computer Misuse Act. The Computer Misuse Act creates offenses such as offensive communication. Many people, public activists who have come out to criticize the government have fallen short of the grip of this act. Stella Nyanzi, for example, was arrested and convicted simply because she wrote a poem, a long poem about the mother of the president. Kakwenza Ruchira Vashaija was arrested and tortured under the same guise that he offensively communicated. Even when he was tested uh, in the Uganda prisons, the doctor who tested him, Dr. James Chisambu, stated that there was enough evidence that he had been tortured. But why? because a man decided to speak up. There are many cases of the Uganda Communications Commission that has also come up and tried 
to impose restrictions, guaranteeing that journalists must obtain licenses to practice, shutting down the Vimeza stations and the radio talk shows, trying to shut down televisions and etc. But all this curtailing of the freedom of expression in Uganda has been twofold. It has been against majorly the opposition and the critics of the government. And that is where we fail in as a country. Therefore, whereas we look at the ruins and the failures that we have faced within Ugandan jurisprudence and our trajectory with the freedom of expression, there is a glimmer of hope. And the glimmer of hope is that we can build back better. What he has just done is take you through a journey of the ruins. Because in order to build back better, we need to understand what the ruins are. So how do we build back better? We have recommendations, just three of those, but we want you to take keen notice of our point of perspective. First, the parliament must carry out assessment of all the laws that are relating to freedom of expression. Hear me, stay with me. They must harmonize these laws so that they are, they are speaking the same language that Article 29 speaks. What I mean here is, let's just look at one law, um, and that is the Computer Misuse Act, right? So Section 25 of this Act um, condones and prohibits willful and repeated use of electronic information to disturb peace. What does disturb peace mean? Quite subjective. What is disturbing to them might not be disturbing to you. So when um, a certain Swai Bunsamba in 2016 posted a photoshopped picture on Facebook of the president in a coffin and his caption was, I'd mourn the death of the president. I'm very sure many of us would, some, some would agree that it is abusive, others would not agree that it is offensive information. So what does this term mean? Where we come from is that we are saying that the phrase disturb peace isn't defined anywhere in this act, yet it is being applied. What that means, it is, it is opening up a door for very many misinterpretations, just as has already been happening. We've already explained the Stella Nyanzi situation. What we are then again saying is that we stand on these lacunas in the law, that unless they can be reconciled and revised to speak the same language, because for example, this section are not defining what, uh, what disturbed peace means, means it is actually in controversial of Article 28 of the Constitution, which says that all laws must be clear. So if the law is not clear, it should be revised to speak the same language clearly as Article 29. Our second recommendation is very simple, that there have already been for questions that are in existence in accordance to the freedom of expression, there have been court decisions that have spoken into these gaps. So the recommendation is that these specific decisions should be act actually applied. What that means is take the case of Andrew Mwenda 2005, take it, move it along with with um, the African Commission Declaration Principles on the Right to Freedom of Expression, which have elaborately explained that public figures should be able to take up a certain degree of criticism. Again, explaining that especially public figures should be able to take in a certain degree of criticism because they are, they are fallible. They are in a place where they could make mistakes. So ideally, they should be criticized. However, even with these decisions, we still have the same things reoccurring. And because the decisions have not been applied, then there remains a gap between the law and what actually happens on the ground. So we need a kind of reconciliation. Otherwise, in a democratic state such as this after COVID, we wouldn't be having the cases of Kakweza happening if these, if these laws, if the decisions in the courts were actually applied. The, the last thing that we want to recommend is that Post-COVID, there is um, more use of social media than there ever has been. However, our contention is that the body that is regulating these um, activities, social media, is one that is not independent. Hear me again. So, Section 9 of the UCC Act 
gives power to the minister of ICT to appoint everyone that sits on the board of UCC. This is a minister. What that means is that they put the UCC under direct control of the executive. What that means is that it cannot be independent. We shall continuously have um, internet shutdowns, people being denied licenses. We shall continue to have people being blocked, websites being blocked and all these kinds of situations. Our proposition therefore, is that in light of this problem, and even when we argue that it might be impossible in such a country to have a body that is impartial, a body that is independent, our contention is, if as a country we cannot push and be able to ascertain that we propel ourselves to recognize global standards of governance, then we might as well say we don't have a freedom of expression. So it is a bitter, it, has, it is a, a, a road of sacrifice that we have to take, but we need an impartial body to regulate what is happening on social media, not a body that is subject to the executive. Therefore, our projection is that we can build back better. It's going to take a lot of work a lot of realization, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of commitment, but surely it is something we can do. Scholars have already argued, we know what to do. The police shouldn't beat people, the police shouldn't show up. But if the police itself is not aware of maybe decisions that were made, if the police itself is still acting on laws that still contravene freedom of expression and rights, and these laws have not been put in realization with Article 29, even if the police knows maybe they are not supposed to beat people, they could have a defense in this very law itself that should be protecting the people. Therefore, we end and say that it is possible to build back better. And so we are back in this journey where we began building back better. I will bring again John Milton's impassioned plea that every single yearning of every single Ugandan is that we ought to have the right to free speech, the right to utter, the right to speak freely above all other liberties. And as she has said, it is a work that is big before us. It is a mammoth, it is a mountain present before us. But we cannot continue bewailing and looking back at the ruins and saying that all hope is lost. There is a glimmer in the darkness, there is a flicker of hope. And this is the point where we build back better, where we resolve within ourselves and decide to come together as stakeholders, entities within the state, entities within all the arms of administra administration and governance, civil society organization, we youths ourselves, and resolve together to forge freedom of expression and realize this right within our nation as Uganda. Thank you so much. I'm Harry Moistigwa. My name is Birinji Prima Elizabeth. We've been working with Prachita Peace Namasaba. We are second year students of the law. This is, is Makere University. University. Thank you.